Uh, welcome to the uh, second day of the uh, CMFE uh, conference, um, our first major conference here at the Research Center. Um, uh, without further ado, let's get going then on uh, session five, Canadian developments in the supervisory realm. And uh, the presenter will be uh, Ted Price. So I'll let you take okay. it away. A little bit crowded over there. I feel a bit better over here on my own. Hopefully the uh, discussants will be kind. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, Canada's financial system has performed remarkably well during the financial crisis. It's troubled most of the developed world in the last few years. This country's sound economic and fiscal situation during this period is due in part to the fact that we traveled a different path than other countries. Canada created a platform for, for success that was more than simply a function of good economic fundamentals. Canada's success also reflects a strong, well-regulated financial sector and well-managed banks. Today, I want to share a few of the reasons why the Canadian system fared so well. I'll also share some thoughts on how banking regulation is de developing in talks amongst global players and international regulatory bodies. Before I get into the core of my remarks, let me provide an overview of, of where we are today, what we're currently seeing on the ground in the banking sector in Canada. So while we have seen the economy improving and risk reduced, events of the last few weeks clearly indicate that we're not out of the woods yet. Improvement of financial institution, institutions usually lags the economic cycle by about a year, and I'm sure there's many in this room that can do a study on that. Um, but there are today some, some early signs that are positive, so let's hope this continues. Generally, the Canadian financial sector fared well, but some institutions were impacted through the, through the course of the, of the recession more than others. In 2009, capital and credit markets showed signs of stabilization and improvement. Although macroeconomic conditions and changing credit conditions continue to impact the historically high rates of return of Canadian banks, they remain profitable and adequately capitalized. Most of the banks reported increased profits with many institutions benefiting from increased capital markets revenues. Canada's larger, larger banks reported improvements in financial performance in 2009 and continue to outperform many of their international peers. These banks have broad, geographically diverse portfolios with extensive domestic and international operations. Their businesses extend beyond traditional lending and deposit-taking activities to include insurance, trading, investment banking, and wealth management. Smaller bank institutions also reported improved results. These institutions are typically regional, some, many of them niche players who focus on one or two uh, credit products such as mortgage, mortgage lending, commercial real estate, or credit cards. Overall, the Canadian deposit taking industry continued to be well capitalized and capital levels were increased last year. I said a moment ago that we're not out of the woods yet. The Canadian system remains exposed to external shocks such as the sovereign debt crisis unfolding over the course of the last couple of weeks and into the next few weeks in Europe, or the threat of a double dip uh, in the United States economy. We're also watching how the credit markets react to shifts in fiscal and monetary policy as the stimulative policies of the last few years are gradually withdrawn. Closer to home for the remainder of 2010, we anticipate a gradual improvement in the domestic economy and rising employment levels. And if that is the case, credit markets should continue to improve. And it looks like the worst is behind us in loan delinquencies and loss provisions. So that's all the good news. While we don't have particular concerns today, sectors we're monitoring closely include commercial real estate and, con and consumer lending. Have we turned the corner? Still too early to say. Um, and much will depend on the strength and stability of the recovery. A strong system of appropriate risk management and robust regu regulation does not spring up overnight. It's been a long journey to get where OSFI and the Canadian financial system are today. OSFI is often asked why we think, what we think contributed to the, the performance of our financial system during the global melt meltdown. There are many, many reasons, uh, uh, but three I'd like, 
uh, that I think played an important role are first, going into the crisis, government, corporate, and personal balance sheets in Canada were relatively healthy compared to, compared to much of the uh, developed world. This, this provided important shock absorbers against the stresses of 2008 and 2009. Second, with a nod to the banks, risk in the banking system is generally well managed. And third, the regulatory regime in Canada has some unique features that contributed to its effectiveness. And among these features were a clear mandate and a regulatory toolkit for OSFI to ensure safety and soundness of the Canadian banks. A regulatory system where all banks and all of their subsidiaries are under the scrutiny of one regulator. And third, robust uh, capital and, and leverage rules. I'd like to explore each of these a little bit further uh, to demonstrate the impact they have had on the success of the Canadian system. Let's look at OTSI's mandate and the tools it has first. Prudential regulation is strengthened when regulators have clear mandates when regulators are free of conflicting objectives, and when those regulators have the necessary tools and authority to deal with the problems as they arise. The financial crisis demonstrated that stress can be exacerbated by conflicting regulatory objectives that make supervisors unwilling, perhaps unable, to require timely corrective action. Currently, some supervisors around the world do not have clear responsibilities and objectives, uh, nor do they have funding that is stable and sufficient. If the, and if the, if the recent crisis is not a wake-up call that, that demonstrates that these issues are of fundamental importance, what would be? In the 1980s and 1990s in Canada, uh, Canada had a rash of small institution fa failures. In 1995, we had a failure of a major life insurer. A key lesson learned from those episodes was that Canadian supervisors had no clear mandate defining their job. Were they to interve intervene when problems were evident, uh, such as when there were significant losses due to poor risk, risk management or excessive risk taking, or were they to intervene much earlier when there were no losses but perhaps some yellow or red flags? So after much debate, an attempt to answer these questions was provided in a legislative mandate for OSFI about 15 years ago. This was part of a larger agenda designed to improve the incentives and po powers of the safety net agencies in Canada and many, in the, many people in this room were directly involved. I can't take credit for it. But it certainly did build a strong foundation um, for the financial sector. OSFI now has a clear prudential mandate to strive to protect the interests of depositors while having due regard to the need to allow financial institutions to compete effectively and take re uh, reasonable risks. For OSFI, this put depositor protection ahead of the need for institutions to compete. The legislation was clear in setting the fundamental pri priority uh, for the supervisor. This was important because supervisors ultimately can find themselves torn between multiple competing goals. In some other jurisdictions, supervisory statements contain wordings like safeguard the attractiveness of the financial center as a location, or others maintain the, company, the country's uh, competitive position. In these situations, supervisors <laughs> may have, may feel torn, or they may be instructed to give more weight to factors other than safety and soundness. OSFI knows what, jo what is job one. And supervisors need to be sure about their job. They need to know how far they, they should push issues. They cannot be timid in their risk assessment, and they cannot afford, uh, avoid dealing with senior management boards at institutions. They have to be empowered in setting rules and in overseeing institutions. So how do we enforce, how do we at OSFI enforce our mandate? When required, OSFI has powerful and flexible tools to take action quickly. But because we share mutual respect with the banks, OSFI is often able to achieve its regulatory objectives without reverting to these formal tools. Looking forward, effective prudential regu re regulatory regimes will be characterized by regulators with focus, with effective tools, and accountability. Successful regulators will not re relax rules to win business from other jurisdictions or to promote business objectives of their domestic institutions if they're not consistent with prudential objectives. Successful regimes cannot, cannot expect regulators to forego prudential objectives to achieve non-prudential goals. Instead, banks and investors will seek re regulation that is focused, it's transparent, it's consistent, and it's fair. 
These are the hallmarks of a strong and reliable financial system. The second feature of, the re of our regulatory regime that contributed to our success is the scrutiny of a, of a single regulator, OSFI. Regulators are increasingly talking about which institutions, activities, and markets should be subject to, to what kinds of regulation. The crisis raised concerns that certain financial intermediaries may have been subject to ineffective regulation or no regulation at all. Certainly, this was a contributing factor to the crisis. Crises, I should say. In Canada, OSFI conducts consolidated regulation of banks and federally incorporated insurers which includes all of their subsidiaries, domestic and international. This results in a prudential regulatory umbrella over all of the major Canadian securities firms and investment banks, as they are subsidiaries of the major banks. Further, the predominant structure for our financial services group is that they are headed by a regulated, regulated financial institution, which is typically regulated by OSFI, so unlike the holding company structure seen in, seen in some other uh, jurisdictions. Having a regulated financial institution at the top enhances our ability to understand the risks facing the group. If OSFI has authority over the top entity, our mandate gives OSFI the ability and the responsibility to identify and act on potential problems throughout the group. So to be effective, our, our experience indicates the supervisors need to be aware of the financial status and risk profile in all corners of the conglomerate. The third feature of our regulatory regime that contributed to our success, in my view, are our robust rules around leverage and capital. And I'll look at those individually. Excess leverage was another key contributor to the financial crisis. In addition to on-balance on sheet leverage, several types of off-balance sheet obligations, such as loan commitments, securitization conduits, derivatives, and many others, effectively increased economic leverage in the system globally. Excess leverage contributed to the pre-crisis pre bubble, but as the crisis developed, the crystallization of losses created capital adequ adequacy issues or concerns, thereby causing runs on liquidity and, in turn, the need to delever. This deleveraging exacerbated the downturn in the capital markets and the economy. Canada, like the United States, has a regulatory limit on leverage for banks. We call this our assets to capital multiple, or ACM. But unlike the US, Canada's ACM includes off-balance sheet items in an attempt to better reflect a bank's economic leverage. The Basel framework talks about three pillars. One, minimum capital requirements. Two, internal risk management and capital adequacy. And three, disclosure to facilitate market discipline. While not perfect, our leverage uh, ratio has proven a, an important fourth pillar supporting the Canadian banking system. In Canada, ACM targets in banks are set individually and range from single digits to a multiple of 23 in terms of the approved maximum. As such, they are customized to a bank's risk profile with large, diversified, and well-managed banks having higher leverage. Going into the crisis, the six largest Canadian banks had an average leverage multiple of just of approximately 16 to 1. This compares to U.S. and European banks, which were often two or three times as leverage, and, some, and in some cases more. The ACM is a blunt tool. Some say it is not risk-based. It's intended to su uh, supplement uh, more precise risk-based capital uh, by controlling leverage. It acts to limit excessive growth and, our, and the arbitrage of risk-based capital rules. A leverage ratio is important because it helps a bank avoid traps posed by low risk-weighted exposures, appearing, which may appear to have no material risk. For example, it's the classic uh, collateralized debt ob obligations that were hedged by AAA monoline insurers. <coughs> a leverage ratio limits, limits balance sheets, thereby forcing banks to allocate <coughs> balance sheet uh, resources wisely, con um, considering risk, reward, and diversification. Internationally, as regulators seek a way to control excessive leverage, a leverage ratio will become an inter an internationally mandated feature of the Basel framework. And further, although this work is ongoing, this leverage ratio will probably ascribe a value to broad classes of instruments and structures that create economic leverage without creating on-balance on -balance sheet assets. 
<clears throat> However, as this international leverage ratio will likely be introduced over time, it will likely to be calibrated for a broad class of international banks with different business models, and will be a minimum standard rather than a bank-specific bank customized framework, we expect our ACM will continue to apply, perhaps with some conforming changes. In the near term, for, in the near term, for Canadian banks, we will continue to ensure that their leverage is prudent given their risk profiles. <coughs> Capital buffers. It's commonly agreed that despite record profits in the years before the, the crisis, many banks went into the turmoil with inadequate levels of, highly, of high quality capital. So when losses arose and markets were closed, new capital could not be raised at reasonable terms. Banks with inadequate, and inadequate capital buffers suffered declining share prices, rising funding costs, and reduced sources of funding. And in many cases, this culminated, culminated in many cases, not in Canada, uh, culminated in government capital infusions and borrowing guarantees. During the crisis, hundreds of banks feel, failed in other countries. Meanwhile, Canadian banks maintained strong balance sheets, capital levels, and continued dividend payments. This is in large part due to higher level of capital, capital, higher levels of high quality capital at the onset of the crisis, and this did not happen by accident. Canadian banks have for many years been required by OSFI to meet a regulatory minimum well in excess of Basel, Basel minimum requirements. Further, to reflect management's view of risk in the capital adequacy plan, banks were expected to set internal capital targets in excess of OSFI rules. But not only is the quantity of capital important, the quality of capital is equally important. While, ba while Basel equal effectively requires only 2% common share uh, capital, that is half of the 4% tier one, um, also a requirement is for Canadian banks, ha has always been uh, for Canadian banks to hold at least 5% common share of capital. The key is that our banks started the crisis with more high quality capital and less leverage than most international banks. So this enabled Canada's banks to continue to raise capital from private sources on reasonable terms, while other banks were not able to do so. Going forward, international regulators will require more higher quality capital, just as and just as analysts have come to increasingly focus on tangible common equity, regulators will work to ensure the common equity makes up a higher proportion of capital. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about rules versus supervision. So to this point, I focus on the rules and who we regulate, the structure of the system. Um, and rules such as minimum capital requirements and leverage ratios are important, but in our experience, how we perform the actual day-to-day -day supervisory on oversight of financial institutions is just as important. To be effective, you need tough rules and effective supervision. I want to discuss the importance of effective, effective supervisory oversight because there's a tendency either to ignore its importance or worse, downplay it. There is a view, not held by me, the supervisory judgment has failed time and time again, and, there we, and therefore we should rely far more on rules than on supervisors going forward. Those critics forget that the rules also failed, and our record in getting the rules right is not stellar. Over-reliance on rules could possibly create a system with even more risk, as rules often have unintended consequences, and which can take some time to be, uh, become apparent. If I can use an analogy, Let's look at highway traffic control. I think everyone here would agree. Legal limits aside, there's a prudent speed limit to driving. In a laissez-faire world, we would each pick the limit that suits us best. Of course, that doesn't work because some drivers would pick speeds so high they endanger others. So we need legal limits. However, in the absence of proper monitoring, everyone would drift back to bad <coughs> behavior, which is why we need it. police enforcement. So rules and supervision combine to keep the roads safer. That is why supervision of financial institutions matters. <clears throat> supervision is the essential task of figuring out whether there could be a breakdown of risk management controls in an institution and whether the culture of the institution and its appetite for risk create dangers that could lead to insolvency. Of course, it's easy after the fact to identify uh, where there's been a control problem. 
when, once the problem comes to light. Much harder to anticipate where control weaknesses might lead to problems before, uh, before they happen. That is what we do. <clears throat> Supervisory out, uh, oversight is about the kind of attention financial institutions receive from supervisors on a regular basis. It's about the questions we ask, what we say to institutions, how we say it, the type of information we, we request, the people we ask to meet, how we deal with pushback, what we, what we do when we go on site or otherwise deal with the institution. It's about the extent to which we tick boxes or think about the core risks and how they're managed. In short, supervisors are the boots on the ground. They are the people on the front lines who identify risk management problems in institutions before they become, before they materialize, and, and they're the people who decide what to do about them. They decide whether to tell an institution to stop growing its business in certain areas until problems are fixed, or require an institution to do more stress testing, or require an institution to raise capital, or require that institution to hire expertise in a particular area to manage risk, or push an institution to spend money on their data system so they can more clearly see what risks they've taken on. These are critical functions, and they help make institutions safer and limit losses. It's beyond me why so much attention is paid to the rules when virtually no, no, there is virtually no focus on the role of supervision. It may be because changing a rule is seen as a concrete step. Uh, it's, it's seen as taking dis, uh, decisive action. It's very visible to the public and can swiftly generate a reaction. It may be in part because flaws in key rules are more easily identified after a crisis. It may also be because fundamentally improving supervision means improving the mandate, the autonomy, the powers, all those things I talked about a moment ago, of a supervisor, and that is very difficult to do. For example, at the start of the global financial crisis, it quickly became apparent that the minimum level of capital, the rules around capital, the banks were required to have under their international capital requirements was too low. No secrets there. And it's easier to change the capital requirements than it is to change the supervisory system, particularly on a global basis. In drafting new international rules for the financial sector, we need to start focusing on the role of day-to-day -day super, uh, supervision. Um, because rules are just one part of the equation. A financial sector with strong regulatory rules, but weak supervisory oversight is not a safe and sound system. To strengthen the global financial system, we need better rules and we need better supervision. Excuse me. How am I doing? Good. So despite its importance, there's surprisingly little information on what constitutes an effective supervisory regime. Perhaps this explains why there are some very different approaches to super supervision around the world. Some of the differences include the extent of on-site versus off-site supervision. For example, some super supervisors have permanent offices at the banks. Others visit for weeks at, at a time, and others visit only for a few hours. Or the extent to which supervisors focus on compliance, which frankly is relatively easy, versus risk identification, and mitigation, which requires a lot of judgment and is relatively difficult. Or some of the differences include the role of the supervisor in corporate governance. Some supervisors send observers to, to sit in on board meetings and observe. What, uh, some put potential directors through intense interviews with experts prior to their appointment. Or there's the extent to which work is outsourced to consultants or external auditors versus being performed by the qualified in-house supervisory staff. And of course, there's different styles or cultures of oversight as well. Some are autocratic, some are paternalistic, um, some are what they call a cup of tea. Uh, there's democratic, there's laissez-faire, and it's all over the map. It's name notwithstanding, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision focuses more on rules and sound risk management practices than on approaches to supervision. Indeed, the Basel Core Principles for Effective Banking Supervision say, quote, the core principles are neutral with regard to a different approaches to supervision, so long as the overriding goals are achieved. I don't think that's good enough. This gap needs to be filled. Let me talk just for a moment about the future direction of regulation. What does the future hold? There are a number of, discuss there's just many discussions underway. Uh, 
at a variety of international bodies um, trying to get international agreement. But it can be difficult due to issues as basic as supervising mandates, different legal systems, and the varied experiences during the crisis. Not every country suffered um, what was experienced in the United States and some parts of Europe. It's pretty premature to draw conclusions right now about what will be the final capital and liquidity rules will look like. Um, we need to give the process a chance and start, and a critical part of the process has really just begun. On April 16th, um, or April 16th was the due date for comments to the Basel Committee on proposals for enhanced capital and liquidity rules that were re released, released back in December. And at the end of April, global banks provided qu detailed quantitative impact studies uh, to, their, uh, to their supervisors. So we're rolling up all that information now. This is going to give us a global snapshot of the potential impacts of all of the proposed changes to these rules. In parallel, an inter international review of the macroeconomic impacts of the proposals has begun. Together, this information will enable us to have an in-depth discussion about what the capital rules should be. We anticipate decisions by the early fall. Uh, by, by year end 2010, it's anticipated that the new rules will be announced for implementation by the end of 2012. <clears throat> the Basel Committee will also consider appropriate transition and grandfathering arrangements at the same time. Having the facts and figures and reports on macroeconomic impacts will enable us to tackle the basic questions such as how much capital is enough? As a bank, you need, you need to cover any possible crisis, or do you need enough to maintain market confidence in such a crisis, which will allow you to, to go to market to raise more? In Canada, we would say that in developing the new rules, too little capital or liquidity is lethal. But if too much capital or liquidity are required under the new rules, then that can be a big problem too. There is such a thing as too much capital. We continue to think that Canada had it about right. Banks had enough capital to maintain market confidence when the crisis hit, and consequently were able to raise more. Many banks in other countries were not able to retain market confidence and had to go to their governments for support. The work to develop a new capital regime is a challenge, and many of you are involved. Uh, because we want, to, we want to get this work done quickly to reduce uncertainty about what the capital requirements are going to be like. Going to be like. Um, but we also want to get it right. And the issues involved in setting capital rules are complex. OSFI in Canada will continue to use our influence to affect the outcomes. And while we're a small country, our success is not going to notice, and our voice has more, has more weight as a result. Further, I think that globally having Canada on board, Canada on board with the final rules will be seen as important, given our track record. But as noted, changes are coming, and the status quo is certainly not going to be the outcome. It's also in the interest of Canada's banks to continue to demonstrate the sound business decisions and prudence that they are known for, which, was, which again did not go unnoticed through the crisis. This also means our banks need to prepare for change. <clears throat> Let me close by talking about a subject that we at OSFI believe may, may be important to the future financial regulation. As a result of the global crisis, there is now a presumption by some, in some parts that governments will use taxpayer dollars to bail out banks. A side effect of this is that it has reduced market discipline on banks and created an, perhaps created an incentive for banks to take undue risks. If this is allowed to continue, it will leave bank supervisors as the main restraint on excessive risk taking, not the banks themselves or their investors. There is also a concern that the current subordinated debt and capital structure in banks was not, in, not effective in absorbing the losses incurred prior to government intervention. They provided little or no, no shock absorption. absorption. <clears throat> Regulators and politicians around the world are setting up proposals aimed at counteracting the effects of this moral hazard on financial systems and to improve the loss absorption of the subordinated capital. You've all seen many proposals including bank taxes, the creation of systemic risk funds and capital surcharges for systemically important banks. To date, none of these proposals has been universally accepted. 
Also, it suggests that there is another way, and that is embedded contingent capital. Contingent capital is a feature on certain securities that would force conversion to common equity when a bank is in serious trouble, thereby replenishing the core capital of the bank without the use of taxpayer, do uh, taxpayer dollars. It would apply to all subordinated securities and would be, a, would be at least equivalent to the value of common equity. So, for example, let's, let's look at a bank that, say, has $40 billion in common equity uh, and issues $40 billion in subordinated, subordinated, subordinated debt ab above this um, with its embedded conversion features. If the bank took excessive risk to the point where its viability was in doubt and its regulator was ready to take control, the subordinated debt would, be, would convert to common equity in a manner that heavily diluted the exi existing shareholders while other temporary measures might also have to be taken to stabilize the bank in the short run, such capital conversion would significantly replenish the bank's equity base. On conversion, the market would be given the signal that the bank had been solidly recapitalized with common equity, and not that it was in trouble and its common equity had been only modestly bolstered. The conversion trigger would be a a activated relatively late in the deterioration of the bank's health. This, this should result in contingent instrument being priced as debt. Being priced as debt is critical, as it makes it far more affordable, affordable for banks, and therefore has the benefit of minimizing the effect on the cost of the consumer in business loans. We suggest one identifiable conversion trigger could be when a regulator is ready to seize control of the institution, because problems are such that no private uh, buyer would be willing to, uh, to acquire shares in the bank. This is advantageous as regulators generally already have the power to seize control, so that it's not new for either bank supervisors or bank investors. The existence of embedded contingent capital would mean that investors in subordinated bank bonds would have a real ongoing incentive to monitor and restrain risky bank behavior in order to, to avoid taking heavy losses from con uh, via conversion to equity. This may encourage more them to demand more uh, disclosure to address these investors' concern. That's a good thing. The purpose of dilution, the prospect of dilution of common equity holders at the same time and associated impl impl implications for bank management can create real incentives for these parties to act prudently. The top of the, top of the capital structure, not capital, but the top of the uh, liability structure, deposit holders and rating agencies would see both common and true subordinated debt available to, to absorb losses. Embedded contingent capital means, provides a means to address many of the problems related to moral hazard that I talked about a moment ago and market discipline with less complexity. It forces the costs of excessive risk taking on the right people, shareholders and subordinated debt holders. The reward for the implementation of contingent capital would be a safer financial system around the world. And we're happy to see that this initiative is now being discussed globally. As, as we believe, it has a lot of merit. In conclusion, if I can suggest a common theme that, expl that explains OSFI's relative success is that OSFI has maintained a clear focus on long-term risk management and capital, and capital adequacy. OSFI has worked with the banks to ensure that these principles were operationalized and were not just part of a compliance exercise. Going forward, there is a risk that regulators will try to regulate more through new rules instead of trying to supervise more effectively. And in my view, that would be about as successful as lowering speed limits without enhanced surveillance on highways. Effective regulation in Canada has met a targeted, principles-based supervisory regime coupled with tough capital and leverage rules. And as the importance of good regulation is heightened in an increasingly complex financial world, we believe Canada has a lot it can share, and we're happy to do so. It's been my pleasure to speak with you today, and I hope my remarks are of value. I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ted. A very interesting talk. Um, we have uh, this session, I, I think, is different from the others in that we have two discussions. So, uh, which of you guys want to go first? <laughs> Okay, so John Chant will... He's got the age and the duty. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give him the age part.
I was honored by the invitation to participate in this conference. In fact, I was doubly honored. I have a mental pantheon of heroes. And in addition to Michael Jordan, this pantheon includes public servants or agencies who have taken the right actions against opposing pressure. Paul Volcker, the central banker, not the White House official, <laughs> is in my is my pantheon for acting against inflation rather than just talking about it as many as uh, of his contemporaries and predecessors had. John Crow is also in my pantheon for doing the same thing, possibly in, in even tougher circumstances. Asfi is also in my pantheon for taking a tough approach, described by David Dodge as tight-assed, uh, to regulation. And this tight-assed approach uh, was one of the factors that uh, contributed to Canada's getting through the crisis in the way that we did. So this is the, the double honor to be able to discuss a paper from Asfi. What am I going to do? Supervision is the topic of the session, and it's something that is virtually ignored by economists. I looked in literature, and even articles that had supervision in the title. They talked about regulation. There's a little paragraph near the end, and then they concluded. So I'm going to give my view of, of supervision and discuss some of the ways it may be done. I'm going to uh, discuss some of the highlights in the history of supervision in, in Canada, draw some lessons from the OSFE proposal, and then suggest some next steps needed for the OSFE's proposal to achieve its goal. Supervision is a process that entails inspection, assessment or audit, and steps to remedy or corrective action if necessary. Its object is to protect the soundness of financial institutions. Supervision is often spoken in terms of government supervision. But such a view is limited. There are other supervisors, depositors, other creditors, other financial institutions, shareholders, auditors, and rating agencies. The history of bank supervision shows clear shifts in the roles of these different types of supervisors, often in response to defining events. When banks first started, they were proprietorships and partnerships. And the visible wealth of the proprietors was one of the things that depositors could could monitor to see if to see if their funds were going to be safe. And this might explain the uh, tendency of banking halls to be very op opulent and grand. And that uh, at at that stage, it provided some some assurance to uh, to. Uh, depositors. By the time banking began in Canada, we'd pass behind, beyond the proprietors and uh, partnerships to common stock banks, but with a twist. From the beginning, Canadian banks had double liability of their shareholders. In other words, if the bank went broke, not only did you lose your investment, you were liable to further payments related to the uh, par value of your shares. Now, double liability had some of the same problems as proprietorships and partnerships. It did limit the ability of banks to raise capital. It also has a, a free riding problem in it in that small shareholders 
have to depend on the large share shareholders to do the due diligence on, on the bank. And in fact, in the Canadian experience, with double liability, banks that were tightly held, banks with, sorry, banks with concentrated ownership uh, did better than banks with dispersed ownership. The, the free riding uh, was less of a problem with, with these banks. There was no, there was no, that, that was the main mechanism of supervision of banks in those days. The next step came was the addition of public auditors, not public sector auditors, auditors but accounting firms. This was proposed in a number of bank act revisions, but uh, the opposition to this was uh, depositors might not be able to understand uh, what the statements of the public auditors were, and it was far better to keep the public innocent without these. But public auditors came in, uh, I think, in the 1880s. And there's an interesting twist there. Canada introduced a dual auditor system. Each bank had two auditors at any time. The auditors were there for two-year terms, and they were selected from a a, a group of auditors uh, approved by the Minister of Finance. So the auditors uh, had an incentive to point to the messes early because their successor was going to have the same incentive. A public inspector, public supervisor of banks was a rather late addition to the Canadian uh, set of supervisors. OSFI was only created in 19, uh, uh, no, OSFI's predecessor was only created in 1924 in response to the home bank failure in that year. And in fact, after 1924, the few years after 1924 were the high highlights of Canadian supervision. You had depositors supervising, you had double liability shareholders, uh, supervising, you had these auditors supervising with strong incentives, and you had the inspector of banks supervising. And the story since then has been, a gradu has been an erosion of these various forms of supervision. In 1935, the double liability for shareholders was gradually phased out together with the note issue. Uh, and by 1954, both were gone. In 1967, deposit insurance uh, reduced the incentives of, of some depositors uh, to monitor uh, financial institutions. Of course, oh, sorry, the next step was that Continental, the failure of Continental, or the near failure of Continental Illinois in the early 1980s uh, created the concept of, or brought to the fore the concept of too big to fail. Uh, Continental, Continental Illinois was rescued. And the, from the years following this, the idea of too big to fail became more and more ever present. The financial crisis drastically altered these, these supervision mechanisms. Too big to fail, so many institutions became too big to fail that we lost the monitoring of uninsured shareholders, the monitoring of debt holders, uh, and in fact, this placed a, a tremendous burden on the public supervisors, like OSFI, because all these other mechanisms that work hand in hand with the public supervisor uh, were disabled by the actions that were, were taken in the crisis. This is not to say the actions in the crisis were wrong. Uh, those actions were probably the only actions one could take in the midst of the crisis. But, uh, 
the, OS the OSFI proposal then can be seen as a way to restore these types of mechanisms is that bondholders or debt holders and both shareholders have stronger incentives now. Debt holders have the incentive because their debt can be converted into shares. Shareholders have the incentive because their shares can be diluted uh, by the conversion of the bonds in a uh, when, the, when the bank is threatened. Now, the, the question I'm going to raise now is, what are the devils in the details of OSFI's plan? And the big devil is forbearance. Forbearance is the allowing a bank in an impaired condition to continue and to continue. And forbearance has been a hallmark of banking regulation throughout the world. OSFI's one element that I believe is needed to back up OSFI's plan, and Ted talked about it, is The, the clear is, is confidence that action, action will be taken when the action is necessary, that there won't be forbearance, because if forbearance uh, gets us back to too big to fail and removes the bondholders and the shareholders uh, from being effective regulators, which the, the plan is intended to do. I guess I have a few differences with Ted, is that I think that the, regulator, uh, the regulators, the supervisors' actions uh, must be very clearly defined. Discretion is the handmaiden of forbearance, and there has to be clear, hard-line tests for when the regulator intervenes. Unlike uh, Ted, I believe that these the hardline test should occur early. In that if you leave it till too late, all the bonds are shifted into equ equity, and this is close to a cataclysmic event. Rather, I would suggest that the bonds be converted gradually, uh, that any capital deficiency of a certain amount be converted immediately. In other words, there'd be a call on the bonds, not for all of the bonds, but maybe uh, enough of the bonds to take up, uh, to restore 10% of the capital. Uh, I believe it should also be based on market-based accounting. We had discussions yesterday about the evils of market-based accounting, but I think you want to ask about the virtues of market-based accounting according to the circumstances. Market-based accounting yesterday was uh, criticized for increasing capital in the strong part of the cycle. Well, today, I would argue market-based accounting is needed for the hard line to trigger the uh, actions of the uh, supervisor in requiring the conversion of these bonds. <laughs> A second feature is what happens after the conversion if the bank does not strengthen. We have to have an airtight resolution process to give these, conver these convertible bonds credibility. I know we have FERP and CDIC has the bridge banks, but in our banking system, this resolution process must be able to work in a way to prevent contagion and it must be able to work to resolve a bank, to deal with a bank, which has a size that equals 45% of GDP. So it really has to 
every possible weakness has to be taken out of the uh, resolution process and the resolution process has to occur in a way that other institutions are insulated uh, from the contagion of, of, of that bank. So credibility, the proposal, the embedded contingent capital proposal, I believe is a good proposal, but it needs credibility uh, to make it work. Uh, people may all say that this is uh, unnecessary. This was a once-in-a-lifetime uh, crisis. I'm beginning to, at my age, I'm beginning to feel like a cat who's almost exhausted his nine lives by the once-in-a-lifetime uh, crisis that have occurred. <laughs> we also need to remember that five years ago, Bank of America, Citibank, Credit Suisse, UBS, HBOS, were as, some of these banks were as highly rated or higher rated than Canadian banks. That the, there are long, long tails out there and even the most highly rated bank uh, can be vulnerable to those long tails. I think that OSFI is doing the right time, the right thing, and they did it before too. The best time to resolve a crisis is to bef before it occurs. Lay the groundwork for something that can deal with the crisis when it does take place. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, next, we'll turn to Don Drummond uh, for another uh, point of view. Uh, thanks very much and good morning. It's a pleasure to be here and it's also a pleasure to have TD uh, be a partial sponsor of this. I hope Chuck explained to you that one of the conditions of that is that you'll all open a TD Bank account. But uh, <laughs> you, you, you all... You all look like intelligent people, so I suspect you already have a TD account, so we can probably uh, pass by that. Um, I was really quite intrigued with Ted's comment that OSFI had been asked so often, uh, why did the Canadian financial system come through this? Because I get that question all the time. Uh, it's been amazing the last two years that I've been visited by camera crews from countries I'd never even heard of before. And of course, uh, they all want to look for a 30 second cl clip that it's one single thing to do it. And I give them the typical economist answer. Half an hour later, the, the camera crew's long gone to sleep, and I have no idea what uh, finally appears. But uh, Ted went through from the regulatory supervisory side, and I think that's absolutely true, the, the critical nature of the capital, the leverage, and the supervisory stuff. You had one mention at the beginning that the bank's behavior itself had something to do with it as well, um, but didn't come back and elaborate that. And I want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, for, for three reasons. That's not, uh, it, well, one of them is it does strike me as an opportunity to make the TD Bank look good, and that's part of the sponsorship deal as well. There was a lot of conditions on the, on the money that uh, went over to that. Uh, second, this may give us some lessons for the future, but probably most critically, I think we need to understand why we were successful if the rest of the world is going to look as a lesson for theirs, because maybe there are some particular features that may not be uh, inherent in their systems. So, I, you know, you know, again, you're looking at it's, it's all the regulatory. Well, if it was all the regulatory environment, how would we explain that all of the Canadian banks all had way above capital ratios and was required from OSFI. So why, we, why wouldn't we just have taken the opportunity to be right at them? Um, even, even during a period, actually, that it occurred in November and December of 2008, we were actually being criticized for a time by very senior people in the government for not lending enough, and yet we were still building up on the capital ratios, and we stayed below the leverage ratios uh, that were required from OSPI as well. So there had to be something kind of independent about it. And of course, it's always difficult to disentangle that because what's culture, it's always a, a, a intermingled with the, the regulatory environment. But also, to how would you explain that TD got out of most of the risky trading uh, areas and its wholesale bank years before the financial crisis hit, and that wasn't being directed by the regulatory environment? 
how would you explain we didn't hold any U.S. subprime? I mean, that came from an independent analysis and a prediction in 2005, the U.S. housing market was about to crash and we wanted no part of it. And again, that wasn't uh, driven by the regulatory environment. You know, how would you explain we didn't touch a single cent of the Canadian non-bank asset-backed commercial paper rate? I mean, that was, again, just an independent analysis that this was a black box and it hardly paid anything more than bank asset and why in the world would you buy a black box if it was 100 basis points, maybe to buy into a black box but for a few basis points, it just didn't make any sense. It, it still baffles me why other people looked at the situation and came up with a, a different answer. Um, why didn't the Canadian banks offer subprime themselves? Uh, one of the things that's quite I'm intriguing on this and I think it's important to, to see where these lessons are applicable to other countries is to what degree the oligopolistic structure of the banking industry in Canada drove some of these results. Uh, which is a little bit ironic because the concentration of the banking sector is often criticized in Canada, but I think you can construct a somewhat credible case that it actually was part of the reason we were relatively successful. Um, why didn't, for example, TD offer subprime mortgages? Well, on the surface of it, my answer to that is because none of the other Canadian banks did. And why didn't they do it? Well, because TD didn't do it. Um, why didn't any of us do it? Uh, well, because, I guess, part in part because the regulatory environment and the oligopolistic structure, we got pretty reasonable rates of returns without going that far out in the risk curve. Why did the United States do it? So many of the banks, well, with 10,000 banks, you're bound to get uh, hundreds of them doing something, moving out the risk curve, and initially you make a lot of money, so everybody goes out the branch after them, and ultimately that branch breaks off. But we didn't have that kind of temptation, and perhaps that was part because of the industry structure. Uh, Ted talked a fair bit about the supervisory response, but I think it's intriguing just to think, in Canada, as he indicates in his talk, you can address 90% of the assets by making six phone calls. That doesn't sound to be too difficult. Of course, you can't do that in a banking market like the United States where you've got thousands and thousands of banks. So again, some of our successes may not be directly uh, exportable to that other environment. Now, I realize now what I'm going to say is going to muck up a little bit the, the agenda for your conference because by this title, it's obviously designed that this was going to deal with Canadian issues, but I find it impossible to think about it in that environment. Uh, first of all, that we're no longer just a Canadian financial institution. We have as many branches in the United States as we do in Canada. So what happens in the United States directly affects us in the United States, but also I think what's going to be imposed or implemented in Canada, the regulatory system will be in good part dictated by what happens on the global scene. So again, we can't separate them. And then uh, thirdly, if we ever had forgotten that we're a small open economy, open to a particular global capital market, we sure got the reminder in 2008 and 2009 because despite terribly differentiated balance sheets all to our favor, we faced the same borrowing premiums as U.S. banks did at the end of 2008. And I screamed from the rooftop of the TD Tower that that was completely unfair, but I, I must admit I have no empirical evidence that my screaming brought down our credit differentials even a single basis point. So unfair or fair, that was the reality. So excuse me, I'll go a little bit just on the international scene. And just, just first point out that we're in a period of tremendous uncertainty and it's very disconcerting um, and the banking community. We know something's going to happen, and indeed we want something to happen. We, know we don't want uh, the rest of the world to go into this kind of crisis because, again, it, it hurt us almost as much as it hurt them, even though we weren't really part of the catalyst for it. Uh, we have a lot of different processes running. Uh, typically, uh, the presentation from us, we talked about the Basel process, but even there, there's a number, and there's some disturbing elements. Is actually, in fact, as Ted described, the sequence. We got the proposals for the capital requirements, and we still do not have the macroeconomic analysis of it. That's going to come afterwards. You would think that would maybe come first, before the proposals, or better, at least simultaneously. Um, just consider for a moment, as we indicated, the Canadian banks are well capitalized and those proposals that were put out at the end of last year, all the Canadian banks, in my understanding and my calculations, would have to raise massive amounts of new capital. So just contemplate for a moment that the Canadian banks, who are the best capitalized in the world, have to raise a lot of capital, how much and worldwide it's got to raise, uh, all in a fairly short period of time. You've got to kind of wonder how that would be digested by the market, but you kind of got to think, wouldn't that sort of thinking be factored into the proposals themselves? So there's, there's some scary things going on there. And there's a whole bunch of other processes not mentioned. For example, the consideration being given to counter-cyclical uh, capital requirements. And that too is kind of scary because uh, you know, I don't think the central bank's uh, forecasting ability is terribly better than anybody else's, and I'm not sure we can call it that quite uh, clearly. And then particularly for a, b a bank that has heavy operations in the United States, in many respects we have separate processes going in the United States. And just remember in Basel I and II, the U.S. and the Western Europeans, 
either didn't accept them or didn't implement them in a timely fashion. So just assuming that whatever comes out of the Basel and the G20 will be implemented to the world is a big leap and we could get uh, some unpleasant surprises uh, coming from the, from the United States. So with that, I think we need to step back in these various different processes and not lose sight of the three fundamental factors that drove this financial sector, because I think we're, we're losing sight of that. And the first was the excessive leverages in the banks, and particularly in their investment dealers. The second was a lack of common standards for the level and, quant and quality of capital. And the third was weakness in risk and liquidity management. Um, I'll just say one word on liquidity management, because I actually think that is an issue actually just in the Canadian. Most of this other we can say we were great and everybody else was faulty. Um, in this case, I can only say that TD was great and some of the others were faulty. But there, there hasn't been typically in the regulatory and the supervisory a lot of emphasis on liquidity and we had this huge mismatching between the sides of the balance sheet. We actually, at considerable cost in TD, painstakingly tried to match those up. But in the height of the financial crisis, it became very apparent that even amongst many of the Canadian financial institutions, they were heavily skewed to very short-term financing. And if we got into credit strike, I mean, they weren't going to last for very long. I mean, we wouldn't have lasted all that long, but at least we would last more than others. And probably a lot more attention needs to be played on that. So there is some good news. I mean, we do have new rules for the trading coming into effect. We're getting a lot of worldwide pushback to delay those. They shouldn't be delayed. We should move forward. As indicated, we did at the end of last year uh, get proposals on the capital requirements. I think the capital requirements itself are okay. What is scary in those is the extensive degree of deductions against what can be ca counted as capital, which again, I think you need to come back to the root cause is the deductions, certainly the deductions that are permissible in the Canadian environment weren't the cause of the crises. So why are we adding these? Uh, many of these investments that are now not counted towards capital provided steady and substantial streams of income that actually cushion the financial blow. So we better be careful at that. We do have proposals for leverage tests, but distressingly they're applied to all assets rather than taking any consideration of the risks of the positions. And just an example of that, if a bank-wide asset test was applied, that's a practice like in Canada of the banks holding the mortgages that they originate on their books may be uneconomical and you would switch away to more than US type of style under these kind of rules. So again, there's a lot of uh, dangerous potential unintended consequences of what's going on. So what do we do in that and when? Well, I think the first thing is we got to get the capital right for the trading assets. So here we again, we have to get this product differentiation. That's the risky stuff and get particular and higher capital requirements on that. We do need a capital uh, standard. Uh, and I think the Canadian one's pretty good to get tier one at something like 7%. And I would say use the standard deductions that are fairly similar to uh, in the Canadian and be really careful on the leverage tests, uh, not applying them at the bank wide level. Uh, that brings me to the stuff that's not so good that's going around the world, and that's certainly the notion of the bank tax, and we're deeply appreciative for the Bishop of Austria, uh, the, the Bank of Canada, the Department of Finance, and Government of Canada in particular are pushing back on this. Um, obviously, the easy knock against it is establishing moral hazard. I mean, you're creating a fund for the best purpose of dealing with banks that are failures so they don't have to deal with it themselves. That's not a good idea. Um, we do want banks to have more capital, but you're first you're draining it away so they can pay this tax. And if you look at the design of it in the United States, again, it comes back, I think this common fallacy of this approach is to not risk weight, uh, that, that the, the tax they're contemplating will be on total assets rather than risk-weighted assets. And I think, again, you just walk right into unintended consequences of pushing the operations out that risk curve. So good for the resistance on that. Um, but that leads me to the intriguing notion of the embedded contingent capital, and I kind of wonder just the context of that. Um, is that being floated because it's believed in, on its own is a good idea? For example, if we didn't have this notion floating around as a bank tax, or we told the rest of the world to screw off, we're not going to follow you in the bank tax, would this be something we want ourselves? And you know, you'd have to raise a question mark on that because we've disagreed, and we heard the Austrian presentation. We came through this pretty good. We have a pretty good system of regulation and supervision. Would we need something like this? I, I agree. It sounds better than the bank tax, but I just wonder: do we really need either one of them? Um, and I don't want to impede anybody from innovative thinking. It is, is innovative, but you've got to understand the context I set. The bankers in Canada are a risk adverse bunch and we get nervous about changes in our cages and this is a pretty big change. It's unprecedented. So there's a number of, of questions I think one needs to pose. Uh, I want particular to Canada, which has a small market oriented towards fixed income investors. Is there a market to pick this up? Would fixed income investors shy away from it because of its equity quantities? And if they do shy away, what, what kind of price would be put on this and what's the overlap to the prices of uh, other assets? 
Um, how much will be charged for such of that market? What's the cost of that relative to other forms of capital? What would the rating agencies do about this? Would they put a rating on this? Um, a little bit what John was saying and, and that staggered approach, I guess they're just coming from that a different perspective. How, how does this operate when you don't actually have that crisis where you're going to become insolvent but you're getting a moderate problem? Because again, I think you could end up with an unintended consequence that if you're trying to raise capital before the point that you've got to a risk of insolvency, you may actually have a difficulty because your shareholders and your bondholders at that time may anticipate this potential future dilution of your capital base and not want to give you the additional capital at, at precisely the time you want it and before invoking a credit. And I think in a bizarre fashion, you may have to be sowing the seeds to get, a, a, get some sh shorting action on your own capital. Um, my f final remark is I think this is really going back to first principles, but I think that that's where I always want to st start. While we did come in Canada through this relatively well, I think we should be very cognizant that there was an element of luck involved in this, and that while the world has, has interpreted and has gone down in history, we were all great at applying regulation, I think we have a lot of vulnerabilities, and I'll use this as a final opportunity to plug a project I've been involved with in the last year, and Nicola Pan has been helping on as well. Um, the bottom line is to try to establish in Canada what we're calling a Global Integrative Risk Management Institute. Why put this? Well, the assessment of it is if we go to the different stakeholders in risk, uh, there's about a dozen universities in Canada have risk programs. They're all pretty light. They're all one-year master's programs. They all tend to specialize in only one particular field of risk, and it depends on the universities. Most of them are in financial risk, but it could be mathematical risk, it could be behavioral management risk. Nobody makes any attempt to make an integrative risk approach, and that's what we're talking about. No one's really dealing with systemic risk, which is what the focus of this is. Uh, in those university communities, we have only really a handful of what you would think would be world-class professors, and there's almost no research body being done. There's no forum for it, there's no journals involved, than that. Um, this spills over to the regulatory policy side. If you're working on the regulatory and obviously on the Bank of Canada, you literally have about a half a dozen people in the Canadian community you can call on to assist you on your that. As we're unveiling, this has been, we're now in the fifth month of the Basel uh, proposals. There's virtually no academics in Canada working on those and what's right with them, what's wrong with them, what the counter proposals would be. The Canadian banks and the life insurance are absolutely wonderful at being reactive to proposals and they can tell you within an hour exactly to the cent what the implications would be, but I got to tell you, and I hate to uh, put my colleagues in an unfavorable light, there's not a lot of bigger thinking going on, the, there isn't that kind of capacity to do that. So I think we have weaknesses in all of these areas and if we want to be good risk managers going forward, we have to be mindful of that and set the seed. So I think we need a couple of things. Uh, we do need one or two programs in Canada that would f f have an integrative aspect. I think ultimately that has to be a two-year program than a one-year program. We do need, let's say, a half dozen or so world-class elite professors to come to Canada and we know how that model works. If you get half a dozen of them, then 20 uh, promising young people will come and then a whole bunch of graduate students will come. So you can actually create a fair bit of leverage. We need some kind of institute that will bring their efforts together and direct the research because in the business world, they are rightly very wary of academics that you'll give them the money and they'll just research whatever they bloody well please and it won't really uh, be designed to be very applicable. And I, my answer to that is actually you can have a tremendous influence on uh, academics and you just wave some dollar bills uh, in front of them. Or we don't have dollar bills anymore. I guess you got to wave some loonies in front of them and you can actually shape that degree. So you need some kind of uh, centralization of that. But I think this is the opportunity. And actually Canada can be a world leader of it. We've got the London School of Economic. We've got the Stern School of New York University. Neither one of them actually do anything I would call integrative. So I actually think in fairly short order we could actually be uh, better than them. I will leave it there. Thank you very much.